Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege for me to welcome you uh, to this event this evening, held to honor Professor Richard Bullitt. I would like to express my gratitude to the History Department at Columbia University, to the Middle East Institute at Columbia University, and to the gentleman who has done the most work for convening this event, Mr. Nathan Stroop, a doctoral student, a doctoral candidate in the History Department at Columbia University. We are gathered here tonight to honor uh, a distinguished professor, a distinguished scholar, a prolific author, a unique mentor, and I can go on and on and think of many, many adjectives and descriptions, but I would say to you that. Most of us who are here tonight, and I can recognize many familiar faces, are somehow touched by Professor Bullock, either as students, as people who have been inspired by his work, uh, by people who, have, people who have known him as a friend, as a mentor, as a rescuer, etc. And sometimes all of the above. We have a distinguished panel here tonight. Um, Professor Roy Mutahide, a longtime friend and classmate with Professor Bullitt from Harvard College, uh, sitting first to my left. Then Professor Mohsen Kadivar, who is visiting at Duke. And last but not least, Professor Juan Cole of the University of Michigan. I will read out brief biographies of each speaker before their presentation. And we are going to start with Professor as I said, a longtime friend of Professor Bullets. They went to college together and later in graduate school, they both worked with uh, Sir Hamilton Gibb, who arguably is one of the last people who would proudly identify himself as an Orientalist. Um, their early work, both scholars, Professor Bullet and Professor Montahed, they worked on early Islamic history, especially city histories in Iran, in early Islamic Iran. Uh, Professor Motahed's work on Azdin continues to be a very important work on early Islamic Azdin, and Professor Bola's more extensive work on Nishapur, the patricians of Nishapur, is a classic in the field. Professor Motahed's other works, uh, his work on loyalty and leadership, about an earlier phase in which Shiite Islam was dominant in Iran or powerful or strictly and strongly present in Iran is also a classic. And perhaps the work, uh, two works that are most, most related to the topic of uh, tonight's event are his book entitled The Mantle of the Prophet, which, is, which continues to be an exceptionally good book on the Iranian revolution and the intellectual cultural background to that revolution. And more recently, Professor Motahed's translation uh, of an important work on Shia jurisprudence by the Iraqi scholar, Sayyid Muhammad Wabir Asad, which is itself a pioneering work and, and a source of inspiration for others to follow. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Professor Motahed to go ahead with his presentation. But before that, I want to ask everyone to please turn your cell phones off. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mateo. Uh, 
looked at before. Um, I uh, also want to say that we are both 72 and we've aged extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in this lecture, I concentrate on two important changes in the outlook of the leading Shiite authorities. Disagreements on matter of belief, matters of belief, are vitally important to understanding actual and potential uh, tensions among the clergy and the succession to its leadership in Iraq and Iran. The differences between the Eastern Orthodox Church and Catholicism are in general more uh, uh, smaller than the differences among many 12 or Shia Shi'is. The first of the two important changes in re recent Shi'i thought is not actually a change, but a revival of an older view. Um, it is the permission to divide religious affiliation uh, between different, uh, uh, different uh, religious authorities. Uh, among the believers or the emulators. Um, I had a long passage from, uh, as you know, the great uh, Shiite leaders, the Maharaja of Takli, the people whom ordinary believers are supposed to emulate, uh, issue, all issue a, res a Rasalat al Amali or Rasali Amali. I say everything in both Persian and uh, Arabic, and um, as this passage, oh, hmm, next passage, sorry, I'm not terribly adept at it. Oh, there it is, all of the Lord of Tehrani, the great book of all of the Lord of Tehrani, Sassanifa <laughs> Shia. Um, he, he, more, he says that, I'm just summarizing, I translate the whole passage here, but he more or less says, that these Rasa'il uh, Ahmadiyya uh, are uh, trees is gathering fatwas needed by common people in their daily action. They were in abundance in the 11th, uh, 12th, and 13th century. In this century, the ulama have satisfied need for them. In the four months in front of them, I'm not going to translate the whole passage, is uh, Sayyid Bahrul Ulum. Bahrul Ulum, of course, was a famous figure. But very end of the 18th century, died 1797 or 1212, and Sheikh Ansari, the great Mortazaya Ansari, who died in 18, 18, 1864. Um, okay, he said you cannot follow the fatwas of somebody who's deceased, uh, so every mufti, meaning every Marjahatakli, has to issue one. Um, this passage was written in 1951. The, uh, the passage does mention an issue still in some dispute, namely the use of manuals of deceased Shiite uh, leaders. Such leaders, of course, uh, are the, as I mentioned earlier, uh, okay, Marajil Taklid, or the uh, reference points for emulation, and um, many, many of them, cons uh, in s as well as being independent uh, um, manual, are commentaries on Al Urwat al Wufqa, the famous uh, treatise by Sayyid Muhammad Qal Yazdi, who died in 1337 or 1919. Uh, al Urwat al Wufqa. Um, uh, Yazdi presents a traditional view. It is not permissible to turn from one muqallad. Ah, it came through. Okay, good. <laughs> I never know traveling from Boston to here. <laughs> These things will come out right, but anyway. From what, uh, uh, one uh, muqallad or emulator to one person emulated muqallad. Um, uh, uh, it is not permissible, says uh, Sheikh Yazdi, not permissible to turn from one muqallad, or person emulated, to another such person, unless the latter is more learned. Sistani, 
this is our Sistani in Iraq at the present time, Sistani comments, not at all, in his commentary on the old words of He says, not at all, bala. <laughs> uh, one may even turn from the most learned to another in matters in which one does not understand the differences between the two. In effect, Sistani's approach, uh, which arguably was uh, adopted by some earlier Shiite chores, but not by uh, Yazdi apparently, uh, Sistani's uh, approach means that one can have more, mar more than one marja taqlid, uh, or point of reference, at the same time. This approach, accepted, uh, uh, accepting more than one marja, is known among Shi jurists in the Arab world as tab'id, uh, and among uh, Shi jurists in Iran sometimes as tajzi'a, uh, or Tajazo Persians, I believe, say more frequently Tajazo. Uh, the term Tabaid has a long history in Islamic law. It means the dividing of anything in parts. It can be a, qu a question of the ritual prayer or payment of a debt, payments of debts. The convenience of this new uh, method, which allows you to cut and paste chapters, not, not, nothing smaller than chapters, but chapters from one Marjah uh, to two chapters in another, uh, of course confines with the deep understanding of, of uh, Marjahiyah or Marjahiyat, which is that, of course, people may be learned in different fields. Uh, it's also been extremely convenient in the Shiite world uh, 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 in recent history for political reasons, so I'd like to explain. Khomeini was late in issuing a manual of practice. He was more concerned that he be followed in, in, in his uh, political jurisprudence rather than the field of Ebadat or Ebadat. He wanted, above all, to perpetuate his controversial theory of Wilayat al Faqih or guardianship of the jurists. The cut and paste method is also convenient for Sistani as the most widely accepted manja in the Shiite world, who is in this way able to share authority with regionally respected um, uh, Maraja. The cut and paste method allows um, one to follow a deceased Maraja uh, as long as, um, um, as one does not uh, have I will, will, this, their manual is endorsed by somebody living. Um, it's been extremely popular with Fadlala of Lebanon, um, where he was until recently revered as a marja, while uh, many accepted the political uh, chapter of either Khamenei or Sistani's, um, Sistani's works on uh, on uh, uh, in their manuals of, of uh, it is probably a sign of Sistani's willingness to share authority that as many of his uh, fatwas or fatwas are co-signed by three uh, marjas of Najaf: Muhammad Sa'ilu, Hakim Bashir and Najafi, and Muhammad Ishaq Al Fayyad. Uh, uh, as you can see. From these features, this is a Hazara from Afghanistan. Uh, all of them <coughs> somewhat lower in rank than Sistani. Uh, Sistani, however, wants to have a sort of collective agreement about many of his more important uh, issues. There are a fair number of issues in which Sistani agrees with the conservative Yazdi, on whom he wrote a commentary. How is the Marja to be recognized? For both men, that is, Sistani and Yazdi, the primary way is through the recognition uh, given to the Marja by the Ahlul Khibra, the people of experience. Oh, there's the gentleman you saw. Ahlul Khibra, the people of experience. Functionally, the so-called people of experience are the upper-level ulama of the Madrasa towns, such as Qom and Najaf, 
clearly the choice of the people of experience is a matter of consensus. Uh, such a system of election by acclamation of the upper clergy does not allow for a really strong hierarchical culture among the uh, she's. People often say she's are hierarchical in contrast to the Sunnis, they are in many ways, but it's a hierarchy based on consensus. The Shiite system of consensual recognition is important to the financial structure of the uh, financial structure of the madrasa towns or the Hoses, where the manja receives contributions as well as the religious tithes paid by Shiite believers, the believers, and then redistributes the money, perhaps in large part, to the clergy. In practice, believers, uh, and especially students, I must be said, the the religious uh, tithes paid to the manja when they follow in ibadat. The religious tithe is paid to the follower whom they fo follow in ibadah. In other words, it, the religious leader who determines how you pray, how you um, fast, and all, all the acts of worship is the person to whom you generally pay your religious tithe. Although you may follow in other chapters, other people. There's, uh, I don't know, I'll skip a little bit. Um, the late Lebanese Maja Fadlala, there he is. Uh, the late Lebanese Maja Fadlala uh, accepts the Iranian political jurisprudence of Khomeini, uh, but uh, he had many. Uh, he was revered by many people in Lebanon and followed in his manual of practice. Um, so he says uh, that in, while, uh, it, while one follows the guardian jurists in general matters, which refer to the preservation of or order, this is hifta nidam, which is an extremely important term in, uh, in uh, 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 Shiite political thought. While one follows the guardian jurists in things that refer to the hifta nidam and the balance of life among Muslims and others, uh, by which the life of society is preserved. End quote. Fadlallah further modifies the power of the guardian jurist by saying there is no harm in having a number of faqis, jurists, in other words, marajit, okay. <laughs> taking care of other general matters. Uh, oh, that's Muhammad Saud al Salaf. Uh, 1944. Uh, um, uh, in other uh, in other matters, one needs a leader from every Islamic re region, Qutr uh, Islami, within, unless this plurality does harm to the Muslim community, end quote. Again, as with Sistani, we see an accommodation to national communities. Fadlallah's opinion about the limitations of guardian jurists coincides with the opinion of Muhammad Sadr. There he is. He's unmistakable. Looks a little bit like Father Christmas, but anyway. <laughs> 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 unmistakable. Uh, Muhammad, Muhammad Sadiq Sadr is his full name. Uh, people just call him Muhammad Sadr generally. Uh, the, the, he's the father, of course, of Muqtada Sadr, widely known for his anti American status. Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad Sadiq Sadr did not want to openly reject Khomeini's theory but he, w he wanted to claim his own authority in Iraq. To this end, he said there's nothing wrong with having uh, a national guardian, Wali Qutr Islami. Uh, and I, he says this several times, actually, in his work. Uh, who will interpret Islam in the context of a national state. Returning to Fatlava, his manual of practice also chips away at the authority of the leading jurists while not sanctioning rebellion. They're all against rebellion. He writes, when one knows for certain that the guardian jurist is mistaken, it is not incumbent upon that person to obey him in matters that are not connected with public order. It's a pretty remarkable statement, actually. 
The second great change in the outlook of Shi authorities is the difference among narrow jail, or sources of emula emulation, in their attitude towards mystical philosophy. Mystical philosophy, we made it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, the um, called uh, in Persian, frequently called Erfan or Erfan in Arabic. The difference in attitude rose to prominence in 2011, last year, when a fairly junior clerk, a cleric named Hassan Ramazani, who teaches medieval mystical teaches the medieval mystical philosopher Ibn Arabi, particularly his book Fosus al-Hikam, in Qom. He visited uh, Sistani in Najaf. Ramazani subsequently published an online summary of his interview. This summary included the following statements uh, about Erfan, according to Sistani. Some, quote, some pursue the goal of making Najaf ugly, and it's Jose uh, Hauza, whatever you prefer, arid and completely opposed to those disciplines. Indeed, the people in Qom say that the Najafis are uh, uncreated and so on. So and they're not, they don't have as good theoretical minds. This has been a quarrel between Iranian and Arab scholars in many periods. Um, Ramazani subsequently published, oh, I'm so sorry, I read that. Um, they well, tried to make Najaf ugly, which is not a proper thing to do. Nevertheless, uh, Erfan, meaning the mystical pursuit of knowledge, is a double edged sword. Pursue Erfan with proper attention to Shariat, divine law and possess the two paths together. Now, Erfone um, Motoshavre, as it's called by a lot of people, is indeed approved by quite a lot of authorities, including, of course, Khomeini himself. Um, immediately, great pressure was put on Sistani to take back this statement. His Najafi colleague, the Narja uh, Ayatollah Muhammad, Ishaq Fayyad, whom you saw before, the Hazara fellow, uh, at the beginning of his advanced uh, class, uh, 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 launched a severe attack and called Ibn Arabi a, a, a heretic, Zindiq, lacking in belief in God. About two weeks after Ramazani's publication of the statement, quoting Sistani, Ayatollah Seyyidan, very influential person, sent Sistani a request for a fatwa regarding his opinion of, quote, the author of the Fusus, meaning Ibn Arabi, he didn't want to even mention his name. Sistani replied in early December of last year, 2011, quote, for my part, in accord with the teachings and belief of the great ulama of the Imamiyya, I do not support the above mentioned method, meaning Erfan. This exchange is interesting from every point of view. First, we see the di continuing importance of the group now called Maktab e Tafkik. It only got its name recently, but it's been a, a movement in Mashhad that's been at least since the 50s. Um, Tafkik means disassociation or maybe better disaggregation. I'm, uh, although I've written disassociation. Erfan, Erfan. Ayatollah, Ayatollah, Sayyidon. Ayatollah, Sayyidon. Maktabe Tafkik. Tafkik. I now think disaggregation may be a better word. Um, of, the, of revealed knowledge attained from the Prophet and the Imams, from suppositional knowledge, uh, especially philosophy and mysticism. Ayatollah so. Sayyidan requested a fatwa from Sistani. Uh, uh, this Ayatollah who requested a fatwa from Sistani is a well known Tafkiki, a follower of the Tafkiks, Maktaba Tafkiki. Uh, the group believes that too much philosophy was mixed with usul al fiqh. 
this is particularly true. Uh, this is a, a jurisprudence of, uh, upon which, as Professor Kamali Khan so kindly said, I translated a book. Um, it, uh, uh, particularly the uh, jurist Alhund Khorasani and his celebrated student, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Hussein, called Kompani. Um, Kompani has to do with British East India Company, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, Sheikh Ishaq al Fayyad in Najaf has also, has, I, as I explained, uh, earlier in his writings, expressed opposition to philosophical jurisprudence. The most important op uh, opponent of philosophy in Rome, uh, where mystical philosophy is still very popular, is of all people, Ayatollah Vahid Khorasani, who is originally from, as you can tell, from Mashhad, from Khorasan, and who is pr probably the most influential teacher of uh, the roots of the law or choice fruits. Um, alive in the press, and he has a class of about 1,000 people. Sistani does not want to take sides in quarrels of the Iranian clergy. Though his son-in-law, Shahristani, resides in Iran partly to collect the khums, or religious tax, paid by followers of Sistani, there seems to have been, from the beginning, a, an agreement to divide some of the, uh, this homes with Khamenei. Uh, it has always been important that this, the leader in Iraq be an Iranian, as is Sistani, but one not directly under the thumb of authorities in Iraq, in Iran. This has been a pattern in Iranian history, and uh, Sistani was prob pars probably partly recommended for his role as Najah Takhli by Ayatollah Khoi because he was indeed an Iranian. Yet the Iranian clergy are apprehensive about their future as Sistani's position as Najah continues to grow in its acceptance throughout the Shiite world, including in Iran, where people often show their independence of the government by recognizing the spiritual authority of somebody in Najah. The move of Ayatollah Shahrudi, or Shahrudi, excuse me, I mispronounced it, must be understood in this context. Uh, Fayyad and Mohammed Saeed al Hakim uh, both have some chance to see, see Sistani, although all these people are in their 70s, as a young age, as Dick and I know. <laughs> uh, Al-Hakim, Mohammed Said Al-Hakim, is considered an Arab, and uh, there always has been some pressure among uh, the Iraqi clergy for a more authentically Arab Najat Um In a way, uh, Shah Rudi had nothing to lose by moving uh, to Iraq. If anything, he put his name into play for possibly a high position in the Iraqi clergy. He is a person with considerable credentials. He wasn't the most popular man in Iran because of some of the offices he held and some of his politics. In Iran, the succession of Khamenei um, depends on the degree to which the Pastoran, or revolutionary guard, guards, continue to be all-powerful. Um, I will skip the section in which I speculate about candidates of the Pastor. Uh, um, interestingly, the young politicians in Iraq, Muqtada Asad, who I mentioned earlier, and Amar al Hakim, Amar al Hakim thought would be okay. Hmm. Those are people I failed to discuss, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Amar al Hakim. Um, uh, the young uh, Shiite politicians of Iraq who come from prominent families or are not terribly learned uh, scholars themselves have to re uh, sustain their leadership by uh, referring to a learned scholar. The position of the Da'wah party is also that they must 
always have a manager. But if you look on the that web website, the that web split in many ways, um, you'll see that um, they haven't agreed on who should succeed. I had Mohammed Bakr Sadr who was their <coughs> great hero, and uh, they don't agree on anybody after him. <coughs> the tension between the cler clergy are many. Uh, as illustrated by, uh, yeah, I'm almost finished. I'm illustrated by their strongly differing attitudes towards mystical philosophy. These tensions illustrate the great difficulty of translating leadership based on consensus into politics. In Iran, the surface toleration among the clergy sometimes wears thin. The expulsion and even imprisonment of some clergy ha 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 have shown that this surface toleration has friable edges. In Iran, this uh, toleration, the toleration of, the, of each other by the clergy seems to me as much or more uh, a fear of a liberal change as in any real solidarity among the clergy themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Matele, for this very informative talk. Um, I would like to bring to the attention of the audience here that what Professor Matele talked about in relation to um, the disagreement on the teaching of mystical knowledge, Irfan, uh, the <coughs> dispute between the two, the disagreement between the two centers of Shiite learning in Iran and Iraq, is of utmost importance. And only a person like Professor Mutahira himself, who is knowledgeable about medieval Islam, as well as modern Islam, can address this issue. It's not just enough to be a modernist to understand the significance of this, of this central debate. And I think we'll be hearing more about this disagreement in weeks and months to come. And I personally want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Mutahida for coming here. This is a testament to friendship, uh, coming here on short notice and, uh, and paying tribute to Professor Bullard. Our second speaker is uh, Professor Mohsen Kadivar, and I would like to introduce Professor Kadivar as Ayatollah Kadivar. And this is not hyperbole, I'm not given to hyperbole. Mr. Kadivar, Professor Kadivar is trained in the traditional <coughs> manners of scholarship uh, that lead to being recognized as an, as, as an ayatollah, as a mujtahid, as, a, as an ayatollah. Many of his cohorts now hold key positions and are addressed as ayatollahs in Iran, but as a man of conscience, Professor Kadivar refused the benefits that would come with that title. And I would not reduce Professor Kadivar to uh, a title like a reformist or a voice of reform in Iran. He is more than that, and what he has done in recent years in creating a new voice of learned uh, Shiite scholars to talk about central questions, new questions, such as a devastating critique of this idea of guardianship of the jurist. He published two volumes, extremely erudite works, called Hukumat al which is a devastating critique of the principle of uh, the al or the rule of the guardian, uh, the guardianship of the jurist. And for that sin, he spent 18 months in the prisons of the Islamic Republic. More recently, he finished and published a book called The Rights of Humans, the rights of the people, Hakkul Nas, in which he offered a detailed analysis of the concept of public rights, civil rights, civic rights, and human rights in Shiite jurisprudence. And he has also published extensively in the history of the contemporary history of uh, philosophy in, in Shiism and particularly in Iran. His talk today is about the genealogy of the concept of guardianship in Iran, in Qom, focusing on the um, 
on the Hosea of Home. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mohsen Kadiba. about Iran and I will give him my best gift, uh, something new that will publish very soon and uh, many of my talk today, presentation today completely is new and it's for you as an Iranian gift to you. <laughs> so the genealogy of the guardianship of Jewish at Trump <coughs> Seminary least 19 since 1960s. It's the dead time of uh, the uh, Ayatollah Bujerdi. And uh, in my 20 minutes, I try to give you a summary of something uh, about this controversial period of Iranian Shi'i authorities in Qom. Also, the domain of this research is Qom Seminary not Iran, and also not all Shi'i community. But it's a good sample of contemporary Shi'i thought, Shi'i political thought. Uh, the recent half century since 1960s is the best period for examining the doctrine of guardianship of Jews in theory and practice. There has been consensus on the guardianship, guardianship of Jews in non-political uh, social affairs, such as minor orphans, or public endowment, or arbitrary judgment from the beginning of the Shi'i jurisprudence in 19th century. They call it the Laat al in Umur al But some kind of some kind of expand in the limit of authority of uh, 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 guardianship jurists could be understood in juridical texts of the late Safavid period, such as Karaki, Muhafaq Karaki, and especially Qajari period after Narabi, but it's not clear without any detail. The greater the greatest Shi'i authority in Najaf, both Iranian, denied political guardianship of Jews strongly. Sheikh Murtaza Ansari and Akhund Khurasani in late 19th century and 20th century. On the other hand, the other Shi'i authority in 19th century defended general uh, guardianship of Jews, including politics, without mentioning any details. His name was, was the owner of Jawahir, or Saib al-Jawahir. The founder of Qom Seminary, Sheikh Abdul Karim Khairi Yazdi, that died in 1937, the same as Ansari denied political guardianship of Jews. He did not involve in politics in Pahlavi first period. He was the representative of the quietists in 20th century. The greatest Shi authority of contemporary Iran, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Abu Tawai that died in 1961, also believed in general guardianship of jurists, but he did not involve politics in the second Pahlavi period and was accounted quite his too. So he believed, Brujerdi believed in guardianship of juries, Hayri did not believe that both of them were quite Practically they were the same, theoretically they were different. Our story begins by this of Ayatollah Brujerdi 
1961. So, The second generation of home seminary that were the students of Hairi, Abdul Karim Hairi, all of them were political. And we should ask ourselves, what happened between the teacher and his student? So I chose for tonight three scholars from the second generation and one scholar from the third generation. The first Ayatollah Sayyid Wuhullah Musabi Khomeini, Ayatollah Sayyid Kazim Shariat Madari, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Reza Musabi Gul Paidani, all of them were the students of Ayatollah Khairi Yazdi, and the last one, Ayatollah <coughs> Sheikh Hussein Ali Muntazari Najaf Abadi, my teacher, was the student of Guru Jardi and Ayatollah Khomeini. He was from the third generation. All of these four, that they are the pillars of my talk tonight were political uh, Shi authority. We can classify these four scholars in three categories. The first one, Ayatollah Khomeini, was revolutionary. The second one, Ayatollah Shariat Madari, and the last one, Ayatollah Muntaziri, also they have different ideas, but their final ideas, we can categorize them as reformists, and Ayatollah Gul Paidani was conservative. So we have three categories, revolutionary, conservative, and reformist. I start by Ayatollah Khomeini. All of these scholars had different political theories. Ayatollah Khomeini had four political theories. So the first theory that was made in 1943, he wrote in his first book in Persian in the name of Kashful Asraf. It was not published in the, for the second time in his lifetime. And in his book, it's interesting. He said that the guardianship of jurists is a controversial issue among the jurists from the beginning, and it's based on some hadith. It was written in 1943. Three decades later, in 1917, when he was in exile in Najaf, in Iraq, in Kitabul Bay, he claimed that the guardianship of jurists is a self-evident issue the difference between the first and the second. It's a self-evident issue. If you bring it, if you bring it to, the, uh, to your mind, you will acknowledge and confirm it. You did not need any evidence except giving it, giving it, bring it in your mind. In the third step, when he was in Paris, he advocated Islamic Republic in his international interviews in Paris, supporting the citizens' vote and implementation of Sharia ordinances. His role, he said frankly, would be the spiritual leader monitoring the governments and the rules, not involving administration. And for the first, the last step in Tehran, 1985, he believed in appointed absolute guardianship of jurists. So, when Ali Khamenei, the Friday prayer Imam of Tehran, and the second leader of Iran today, expressed in Tehran in, 19, in, 18, in 1985 that the power of guardianship of jurists is limited to Sharia ordinances, Ayatollah Khomeini declared in an open letter that the power of guardianship of jurists is beyond the primary Sharia ordinances, the same as power of prophet and imams. And he said also that the, uh, according to his final viewpoint, protecting the autocratic regime is the most required among the required ordinances in Islam. So, Ayatollah Khomeini had a lot of innovative ideas in uh, political Islam. 
I do not have enough time to mention his other innovative ideas. The second scholar, Ayatollah Musavi Golpaigani. I call him a conservative, moderate Shi authority, no revolutionary, neither reformist. He was a spiritual religious authority. His political activities were secondary and not primary. So he believed in general appointive guardianship of jurists. But to be honest, practically, he believed in supervision on rules with the right of veto. He did not believe in involving to politics by the jurists, and he did not himself involve to the politics. He was supporter to Islamic Republic from the beginning to end of his lifetime. For him, Sharia is the restriction of the power. So he rejected absolute power beyond Sharia. So he, in this point, he was against Ayatollah Khomeini. He saw that no, he's a, a, a Shi authority in the name of Ayatollah Safi Golpaigani. In the time of Ayatollah Khomeini, he's the son, the son-in-law of uh, this marja, was the head of guardianship council for eight years. So it, it was some guarantee from Ayatollah Khomeini to Ayatollah Sharia Madari about implementation of Sharia. He criticized all rules made beyond Sharia ordinances from a conservative position. So he was the head of home seminary from 1980 to, nine, to 1993 for 14 years. He did not change his mind from the beginning to the end. He was on one way. The third person, and in this part, you will hear a lot of new points. He was Ayatollah Seyyid Kazem Shariat Madari. So, one year younger than Ayatollah Khomeini, and he passed away in 1985. So, he had he was cultural reformist. We can call Ayatollah Khomeini political revolutionary. So he believed in culture more than politics. Ayatollah Khomeini believed in politics more than culture. Because of it, and he had different periods of, in his uh, political life. In 1962 to 1965, he participated in a struggle against the government supporting domination of Islamic ordinances on parliament uh, according to Iranian constitution. On that time, he rejected the female votes, the same as other Shi authorities of his time. So what was written in English about him, I think it's not authentic. In 1966 to 1977, in this time, he established the House of Propagation in the name of Dorot Tablir, and he published a journal, or the first journal, in the name of Maktab Islam. It was the first journal of home seminary in his time. But something that is interesting in his, uh, in his thought, the thought of Ayatollah Shayyat Madari, he started teaching on Velayat al faqih four months earlier than Ayatollah Khomeini. And these times, this date, are accurate date. He started in October 1969. Ayatollah Khomeini started in February 1970, four months later. So it's the question. Both of them, in two different ways, started the same topic in distance of four months. And when I, this book, the book of Ayatollah Shariat Madari, unfortunately, it was published in 2007, in seven volumes. And one of his students in the name of Hussein Haqqani published it. Also, he has an Arabic interview that was published in uh, 1972. The interviewer is Muhammad Jawad Mughniyeh, one of other students of Ayatollah Shariat Madari. 
in both of these works that there are a lot of details in the light of Faqih, there is no difference between Ayatollah Khomeini and Ayatollah Shariat Madari. Both of them believed in the theory of general guardianship of jurists. I tried to read some of his uh, statements of Ayatollah Shariat Madari in 1972 and 1969. He criticized Sheikh Ansari because of his denying uh, guardianship of juries, and he confirmed it according to some hadith. He believed that there is no guardianship of juries in personal affairs and prohibited issues under sharia, not beyond sharia. It's the difference between sharia madari and Khomeini. The jurist is not lawmaker, the jurist is not shari, but Ayatollah Khomeini believed in opposite way. The juries are responsible for implementation of public Islamic ordinances in the time of occupation, according to Shariat Madari. He wrote, frankly, theocracy is necessary and an inseparable part of Islam. It's not only Ayatollah Khomeini that believe in this case. Ayatollah Shariat Madari said the same thing about theocracy, about Hukumat al -Dini. He wrote that the juries are the ruler and the rules are sharia by ishtahab. All of these things were written by Shariat Madari 10 years before revolution. In the last year of royal despotic regime in Iran, he advocated the constitution of 1906. It's done before. Shah he accepted Shah as symbolic arbiter, not as a ruler. On that time, Ayatollah Khomeini tried for a regime change, but Shariat Madari in the same time tried for some kind of reform. In 1979, he was the most influential opposition of Ayatollah Khomeini, and he started his second course on the guardianship of juries in summer of 1979. When we have Majlis al Khubragan, Ayatollah Shariat Madari started his second course on guardianship of Jews. In his second opinion, he reached in this point that there is no right for the clergy, for the, clergy, for the Jews to involve uh, uh, politics and to get any political job. The only thing that is allowed for the Shi'i jurisprudence, for Shi authority, is monitoring the rules of the parliament, nothing more. So you can compare the first theory and the second theory. The first theory, 1969, the second theory, 1979, less than about 10 years. The first and the last one, Ayatollah Sheikh Hussein Ali Muntazirina Jafabadi. He's the youngest among these four and from the third generation. He had also four different political theories. And by comparing these different theories, I will have a very important conclusion after this. So, his first theory was the same as Ayatollah Khomeini's theory. It means that appointed general guardianship of the jurists, plural, not singular. It means not the fabric, not only one jurist. His second theory, the same as the first theory, plus two, three powers under the leader, concentrated all of the, there is no separation between judiciary, parliament, and executive power. All, all of these three are under the power of uh, leader. But in his third theory in 1984 to 1998, he believed in elected limited guardianship of the jurist. So it, it's limited to the constitution. Also it's elected by the people, not appointed by God, and in these two points, he criticized his teacher, Ayatollah Khomeini. 
and his last theory that about 10 years before his death, only he believed in the supervision of the most learned jurist al Sahib al-Alam on the lawmaking. It means he denied exec executive participation of Sahib, and it's the main part of the life of Sahib. He was the founder of guardianship of jurists in Iranian constitution, and he reached this point. It means the light of faqih reduced to nazarat of faqih. The flam guardianship to supervision. And I think it's a very long distance that he made. And my conclusion. The first point. <coughs> the theory of political guardianship of the jurists and the limit of their power depends on three items. <coughs> the first item is practical experience of politics. I want to tell you should feel politics by experience, not by theory. Practically, you should participate in politics. After that, you will understand politics. I think Naraki or Karaki did not participate. If they didn't have any experience Ayatollah Khomeini or Ayatollah Muntazir or Ayatollah Shariat Madari had this experience. Because it's the first part, and the second that is not so good, the logic of the situation. It's important for the jurist. He was in the power or he was out of the power. Ayatollah Shariat Madari made his theory, first theory, he believed or he thought that in future, he will have some power. His second theory was made when he was out of power. Ayatollah Muntazari had two turning points. His first turning point was happened when he was in power. He's supposed to be the successor of Ayatollah Khomeini. And he shifted from appointed to elective. It was so important that his second shift that he denied the executive power of guardianship of juries, it was when he was out of the power. Ayatollah Golpai Ghani, he was permanent. He, was, he did not have any shift at all. So it was the first point that is so important. And the second point, the talent, the passion, or the personal attitude of the jurist. It's so important in the theory. So. When we want to analyze the theory of Ayatollah Khomeini, I think his attitude, his personal attitude, is more important than the other things. The same as Muntaziri or Shariah Nazari or the other. And the third one, something that is the students of the seminary should attention to it, the, the, the scripture, or the tradition of prophet, or the tradition of imams, had the least effect on the political theories. It means that, I did not find any effect from the Quran or from the tradition of prophet or imams in these different theories. These different theories came from different personalities or different situation of the person. And it's the meaning of historicity. I think we should think about these points. And the second and my last uh, conclusion. Two political duties of the jurists. It's the summary of the reformist uh, Shia authorities, Sharia Madari and Muntazir. <coughs> so they reached from two different passes to the same uh, conclusion. The first thing is leading the believers against unjust ruler. It's revolutionary duty. It's before regime, not after regime. I think many Shi authorities have consensus on this point, the first point. And the second point, that is after regime, it's supervision of the juries on the parliament rules with the right of veto. So it's the minimum of guardianship of juries. There is no guardianship, it's only supervision, monitoring. And it's the end of Shariat Madari and Montazari. And I wrote myself, this is return to religious base of the amendment of Iranian constitution of 1906. It means eight years experience of Islamic Republic 
for Muntazari and Shariat Madari was this point. It means that they reach the point that they started from that point. Thank you so much. changes in, in this presentation. Let me um, remind the audience of a, of a key Shiite dictum, Shiite teaching, that the most virtuous act is to speak the truth to power. And Dr. Kadivar, along with his recently deceased friend, Ahmad Qabin, are voices that speak truth to the power. Our last, our third and last speaker, Professor Juan Cole, holds the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professorship of History at the University of Michigan. He's a prominent scholar, public intellectual, essayist, and blogger. Because my personal familiarity with Professor Cole is minimal, I will read, I will cite a review that Professor Bullitt wrote of of one of Professor Cole's books. This is a collection of Professor Cole's writings on the modern history of Shiite Islam that appeared in 2002 as Sacred Space and Holy War, the Politics, Culture, and History of Shiite Islam. Bullard writes, Juan Cole's History of Shiism is the right book at the right time. It is essential reading for anyone, scholar, Okay. Well, scholar, policymaker, student, and everybody else. Now, I realize that I have misplaced the rest of the quote, <laughs> so I have to, uh, I have to just pop from memory again. Uh, the most important work of Professor Cole that I have benefited from is the monograph that came out of his, his PhD dissertation, Roots of Shiism in North India. And, Shiism in North India and its roots in Iran and Iraq. I hope I have the title uh, correctly. Uh, and in that book, he did pioneering work on the kingdom of Abad in India, a Shiite kingdom between um, the decline of the Mughals and the ascendancy of British colonialism in India, which played an extremely important role in later Shiite history, including the effect that it had in a name like Kumpani that Professor Mukhtar had mentioned earlier. So people who want to know why Ayatollah Kumpani was called Kumpani can read Professor Koh's book. His other book, uh, Modernity and the Millennium, brings to our attention the significance of what uh, Professor Kadivar, the point that Professor Kadivar made at the end, this return to the Constitution of 1906, the whole process that Iran has gone through in adapting and working religion, and his work has pioneered to show the significance of religion in Iranian politics, among other things. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cole. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Uh, the rest of the quote is at my website. I like that. <laughs> Thanks to Dick for writing it. it. It's a matter of great honor to be here uh, to commemorate uh, uh, Dick Bullitt's uh, retirement, uh, uh, a retirement which is very incomplete because as I understand it, he's now got an opportunity to get at the seven books that he's been working on and uh, get them out. Uh, so we're all looking forward to being further edified. Um, and it's a matter of honor to be on the uh, rostrum with, uh, uh, with, with dear friends and great scholars. Uh, and um, I want to talk today very much in the spirit of what's already been said uh, about what I see as the spiritual, uh, legal, and, and political role in the past decade, uh, and, and I'll, I'll focus really on the first few years uh, after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, of Sayyid uh, Ali Sistani, uh, Najaf, 
Uh, and I'm going to make an argument that we have fatwas from Sistani. Uh, we have juridical works uh, of great erudition. But as a historian and um, frankly uh, a part-time journalist, I'm also interested in what he and the people around him have told the press. Now it's of course possible that sometimes the press will get it wrong, uh, but they've given a lot of interviews. And I think that that network of information that comes out of the press interviews has to be seen as contextualizing the jurisprudence. So if we want to know what he means by a fatwa, we can't just situate him in the history of fatwas and look at the philological meaning of the words. But if he gave an interview with Der Spiegel in which he explained the fatwa, we have to keep take that into account. Uh, and uh, I've had, uh, the reason I say all this is I, I've had arguments with a person's not here, uh, but uh, scholars in the field about what Sistani means by his fetwas, uh, and I find them strangely disconnected from, from this other information that I followed very carefully. Sistani uh, is the spiritual leader of most of the world Shiites outside Iran, and does have followers in his homeland as well. He was born on September 3rd, 1930 in Mashhad in eastern Iran. His grandfather, a cleric, had studied in Najaf. Uh, in November of 1948, at the age of 18, Sistani went to Qom to study with its scholars, including the then leading Shiite authority, Ayatollah Hossein Borojerdi. And as we heard, Borojerdi was more cautious about clashing directly with political power than was his student, uh, Rohalah Khomeini. Sistani made his way then to the great seminary city in Iraq of Najaf. And uh, this was an era when both Iran and uh, Iraq uh, were monarchies. Um, Sistani arrived in uh, November of 1951. He began studying with Ayatollah Abu Qasim Khoi and other great scholars res resident in Najaf, some of them also from Iran. And he finished his studies in 1960, at which time he returned to Mashhad. According to the biography of him on his website, uh, he had intended to remain then in the city of his birth. Uh, perhaps not sure of his future, and here I'm guessing by just historians' contextualization, uh, in 1958 there had been a revolution in Iraq. It was a nationalist, Arab nationalist revolution. And it's not impossible that Sistani goes back to Mashhad because he's not sure what is, the, what is going to be his fate in, uh, in Karim Qasim's Iraq. Uh, but then, after a year or two, he, he comes back to Najaf. He doesn't stay in Mashhad. And I don't know why. Um, it's not impossible that, you know, he found the Shah's policies even less palatable than those of, of Qasim. Um, in any case, uh, he, um, he became eminent in Najaf, which is not an easy thing to do. He became an expert on this 19th century book of Shiite uh, traditional commercial law, uh, Makassim of Sheikh Al Ansari. When I was a graduate student, I was very interested in all aspects of Shiite Islam. Uh, the Makassim hadn't been reprinted in a long time, and I I, I got an interlibrary loan, this old copy of a 19th century lithograph of this book. I was so eager to work myself through it, and sure it was contained enormous treasures. And and I, I picked it up and I started working on it and, and I couldn't understand a single word. <laughs> Not a word. My Arabic was pretty good by then and I had spent a lot of time studying Shiite jurisprudence. I don't understand anything that was being said there. And I began to realize that that's a no whole other PhD. Uh, so, Sistani is an expert on that book. And he has my uh, uh, admiration. So, when Abu Qasim Khoudi died uh, in the early 90s, and after the death of another aged Ayatollah who, who kind of was interim, um, Sistani be gradually became widely recognized as the chief object of emulation for Iraqi Shiites and 
and many Lebanese and Pakistani Indian and you know wherever there were Shiites uh, 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 came to follow him and and some in Iran although in Iran it wasn't so much that he had competition from Khamenei because Khamenei at that point really was mainly seen as a political leader who happened to have been shoehorned into this position of the supreme juridical authority in Iran. Uh, and indeed, Khamenei forbade Iranians at that time from following him uh, religious, uh, in with regard to the religious law. I um, mean, they had to follow his governmental edicts, but he wasn't putting himself forward as a object of emulation uh, for Iranians. But, but there, were, there are lots of Ayatollahs in Iran, so Sistani's real competition was with all those other Ayatollahs. Um, and, uh, but, but outside Iran, he, he almost certainly was the preeminent uh, authority. Uh, Linda Walbridge, uh, who uh, had a history here at uh, Columbia, um, and wrote about Sistani at a time when he was being ignored by most of, of the other uh, scholars, uh, suggested that Sistani had uh, many sources for his growing authority in the 1990s. He benefited from the relatively low esteem in which supreme jurisprudent Ali Khamenei's scholarship was held among Paya Shiites. Uh, and uh, moreover, he benefited financially because 